All right, when Ezekiel 18, look at verse 20. Ezekiel 18, verse 20, the Bible says, The soul that seen it, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. The title of my sermon this morning is Generational Causes. Generational Curses, just to be clear. <laughs> so, now, it may not be used with the same phrase, but the idea of generational curses is believed in all cultures and by all peoples. It's just human nature for people to think, oh, a curse passes down from generation to generation, and there's nothing the children can do. And I mean, some people believe that it's not just a curse. Every habit, every behavior is passed down from one generation to the other. The good, the bad is, you know, why are you being blessed? Oh, it's because of what your parents did. Oh, why are you, you know, people just believe it's all passed down. Now, there is some truth to that. If not, it would not hold by now. There is some truth to that because of nature. A child that grows up in a house of smokers will most likely end up being a smoker. Uh, I, there was a contractor that was working in my house and he, sm he was smoking, him and his friend, uh, both of them were smoking. So I went up to them because they were kind of close to my house. <laughs> so I went up to them, I was like, you know, why are you smoking? I mean, smoking is not good. And I've been, I've, I used to have many friends in college, they all smoke and I, I always talk to them and they know it's bad. But this recent one, he's like, he knows it's bad. He, he's a so-called Christian, so he's praying that he should stop smoking, and his father used to smoke, but his father doesn't smoke now. The day, like, or the year, I should say, that the father decided to stop smoking, he was 17, and that was the year he picked up smoking. Can you imagine that? So if the father stopped a year before, he probably wouldn't have been smoking, but he saw his father smoking, and saw his father smoking, and the father knew it was bad, so the father stopped smoking. Now his father's an old guy, he's warning his children not to smoke, but they are smoking, and this has been for years. I mean, I mean, <laughs> they, they want to stop. Every year they want to stop, but they keep on smoking. So if you grow up in a house, if a child grows up in a house of smokers, they will end up picking up smoking. The same with abusive parents, or divorce, or drug addicts, or thieves. You know, you, the children end up picking up what their parents do, and it might appear as a generational curse. Oh, this child is, is just cursed because of what the parents are doing. But it's nature, just seeing and doing. So why is that so? Why is there truth in that? As I said, because of nature, the flesh only knows what it is exposed to. If the flesh is not exposed to it, it might not know of it, it might be hard to get into it because it doesn't know. An extreme example is a child that is molested. A, a molested child, I'll just keep it PG because we're in church. A molested child grows up and that is the only way the child knows pleasure. It, and it's just sad and the child gets into that bad habit. Although the child doesn't like it, but that's the only way the, the flesh knows. Or you know, a, a lady that's molested too, that's the only way she gets pleasure. It's because that's what the flesh is exposed to. And exposed so early, that's what satisfies that flesh. And it satisfies the adult. So you lost after what you have experienced. Open to Exodus chapter 20, Exodus 20 verse four. So what does the Bible say about generational causes? Many people will point to this passage, you know, uh, in the uh, new, uh, in the Ten Commandments, the second commandment that God gave in verse 4 of Exodus 20, the Bible says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself, sorry, thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, unto the third and fourth generation of them that hates me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So you say, well, right there, that is the generational curses. God will curse the children, the next generation, unto the third and to the fourth generation. God is not causing the subsequent generation to fall into the same iniquity. It's not that God is making them do it, because then that would be the curse, <laughs> right? Making them sin. I mean, that's just horrible. But it's showing us that they will fall into the same iniquity. By they, I mean the generation following, generation as a whole. Doesn't mean individual, like every single individual. But that generation as a whole will fall into that same iniquity. Uh, but some individuals might not. And why? Because these are rejected people on, whose, on, on whom the wrath of God is upon. Right? God's wrath is upon them, so he has no mercy on them. 
That's something key that we, we fail to realize that the mercy of God is upon our lives. Without the mercy of God, we'll be consumed. Every day, His mercy is renewed every morning, as the Bible says. So the Bible says, He showed mercy unto whom He wants to show mercy on. Right? In Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, what did God tell the children of Israel? My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. That means I'm not going to show mercy on them. I'm not going to draw them to me. I'm not going to help them when they're falling into the same iniquity you're falling into. Because I'm going to punish them to the second and to the third generation. You see that? So that's why it says he'll visit that iniquity, uh, the, the punishment on the second and the second, third, fourth generation. So compare those, or compare it with those that the Lord loves. Those that love the Lord, God will show mercy on their next generation, right? He will help their next generation. Their next generation is going into sin. He's helping them. He's drawing them back. He's, you know, he's trying to win them over back, you know, because he's showing mercy. And you can't say, oh God, why are you showing mercy on this one? I'm not showing mercy. He can show mercy on to whom you show mercy on to. Everybody's going to go into sin. Okay, I'm deciding to show mercy on this family. I'm deciding to show mercy on these people because, oh, their fathers served me. Their fathers loved me. So it's because of, the, of your father that I'm showing mercy on you. Amen. It's not that, oh, I'm now causing you not to sin. I mean, Israel, it's not because of your goodness. It's not because of your righteousness that I'm helping you. So that commandment that he, was gave, uh, that he said, you visit the iniquity, is not a generational curse that, oh, no matter what, these people are caused to do that. No, if they decide as an individual to come out of that, then... They'll, they'll be free of the punishment of the sin because the soul that's seen it that's the soul that'll die <laughs> right so this passage does not prove generational causes neither is God punishing them for the sins of their parents because also in Deuteronomy 24 16 the Bible says the fathers shall not be put to death for the children neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers every man shall be put to death for his own sin so don't think, oh, the third and fourth generation, they are, they, are being, they, are, they are being punished or they are being put to death because of the sins of their parents. So where did Cain learn to commit murder? Right? There was no murder ever committed, as recorded in the Bible, before Cain committed murder. So where did he learn to do that? Because so they pick it up, right? They learn. Sin is just in, in flesh, right? And it grows and grows. It gets worse and worse. A simple lie can end up leading to murder. You, you tell a lie, you hide that lie with another lie, you steal you, until you have to kill someone to hold that lie. <laughs> so, it, it sin just builds upon itself and builds upon itself. You don't have to teach people how to sin. Now, when you teach them how to sin, it's almost guaranteed <laughs> that they're going to copy and do what they have sinned. And that's why it looks as if it's going from generation to generation. It, up to Genesis chapter 4, Genesis chapter 4 verse 6. This was Cain that was not willing to sacrifice a lamb. God said, bring me lambs. Sacrifice lamb. He didn't want to kill a lamb. He would rather bring vegetables, right, for the Lord and fruits uh, and, and sacrifice that. But he was willing to kill his own brother. So Genesis chapter 4 verse 6, you know, God was trying to help Cain. And I want to show you that. He was trying to help Cain to prevent him from committing that sin. And the Bible says in verse 6, And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wrought? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. That is the warning. It's sin. It's something, you're going to do something evil. You're going to do something wrong. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and came to pass when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. So God warned him, just as God is warning us now. God is warning us because he loves us. He doesn't want us to go into sin so that punishment to be upon us. How is he warning us? By his word, by the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, leading us and directing us. So grieve not the Holy Spirit. Don't quench the Spirit. Through your parents warning you, through messengers of God. In fact, anything, anybody, God is using to warn us. You know, evil things can happen in our lives, or you see things, or memories come up. God is just warning us not to fall into sin, and you will know. When you're usually doing something wrong, you're on the wrong way, God would send something that might warn you, and if you still don't want to change, you might think, oh, I, I got this. For example, Samson. Samson was going to marry the wrong woman, Right? You say oh, it was the will of God. It was the will of God for Samson to deal with the Philistines. But Samson chose to do it the wrong way. He went to marry a Philistine woman. And what did he meet on the way? A liar. 
right? He shouldn't be going there, but he met a lion on the way. So, but yeah, he tore the lion apart to be like, oh yeah, so God is for me. No, no, no. <laughs> God was just sending him a warning that this is not what you should do. Anyway, and that's why he couldn't tell anybody. Right? Even after he went back to the lion and all of that. So the next generation is naturally susceptible to the same sins. Because we have, your next generation, the children, have the same thought process of the parents. Yes, we are individuals and no one is like us. We are unique. But we have the same DNA. DNA is passed down. And we live in the same area. We eat the same foods. You're like, how does that matter? Your guts your reins, as the Bible says. You know how you have a gut feeling? Where, did, where do you think that came from? <laughs> people didn't just, people knew, it's like it comes from down here, not necessarily, I mean, I know our thinking faculty is up here, but why does it come from down here? Because the chemicals that are pro produced in your brain, they come from your guts. What you eat, the kind of bacteria formation that you have in your gut, that is your, inter when I say gut, I mean your intestine, large intestine, your stomach, all of that. So what you eat affects the bacteria that is in you. And I don't want to go into a biology class, I'm not an expert in that. But I know that that affects the hormones that are released, the chemical that you have in your head. So it affects how you think, what gives you pleasure, how much pleasure gives you, all of that. So you have this gut feeling because uh, so you have the same gut feeling that your parents have because you're eating the same thing, you're in the same neighborhood, you're breathing in the same air, you're seeing the same thing, you have the same DNA, you're exposed to the same situations. For example, Abraham lied that his wife was his sister. Okay, half lie, but if it's not full truth, it's a lie, right? Just like the devil, there's no truth in him. Anyway, so Abraham lied that his wife was his sister and omitted the truth that it was a wife. The same thing, Isaac wasn't born. <laughs> Isaac did the same exact thing. He said, well, Isaac wasn't there to learn it from his father. No, he wasn't, but the same DNA, the same situation, right? He's going to do the same thing. So uh, that is just a generational cause. All of them are just going to keep lying. No, don't just say it's a generational cause. Now, there's some things naturally that happens, but nature shows us that uh, the, the child would want to be like the father and that's what God was showing uh, when he made that commandment saying even to the third and to the fourth generation so there's an aspect of nature there if your father has a sweet tooth you might also want to have uh, you might also have a sweet tooth and that's why the Bible says in Lamentation 5 7 Lamentations 5 7 our fathers have sinned and are not that means our fathers have sinned and have died and we have borne their iniquities that means we are doing what they are doing is a poem. He's trying to say, we're copying what our fathers are doing. And that's what uh, Jeremiah said when he was lamenting about the sins of Israel. So this is why parents should address the sins in their lives. Open to Genesis chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5 verse 21. Address the sins in your life for your children, for the next generation. You know, start, work, work with yourself first. And and that flies in the face of those that send their children to uh, public schools or somebody else to take care of your children because then your children are going to be picking up those people's sins, <laughs> right? They're going to be the same cuss words they use, the same mannerism and all of that. I mean, throughout their waking hours of the day, they are learning from those people. You know, they are just learning from them. So when they come back, they are tired. Their brain has shut down. They're not really learning much. You tell them, oh, what did you do today? How was everything? Did you do this? They're not in the mood to learn. They're just tired. So <laughs> it's early in the morning. You see them, like 5.30 at the bus stop, <laughs> right? And very early in the morning going. Uh, that's when they learn. But I digress. It's not about public school or anything. But I'm just saying. So they will pick up what you are dropping down, basically. So parents should learn to address the sins in their life at least for the sake of their children. If not for your sake or, or you don't want to please the Lord, just think about your children, whom God has given you, that you have stewardship over. Methuselah was the oldest man, blessed with the longest days, and his father Enoch got right with God after he was born because of Methuselah. That's how the Bible reads to me. The Bible says in Genesis 5.21, and Enoch lived 60 and 5 years, that means he was almost like a teenager, right? And begat Methuselah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> in those days, in those days, you know what I mean? So, you know, Enoch was, you know, this is a teenager and he had a child? Come on. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding, guys. And Enoch lived 60 and 5 years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah. So, right, he got his, his act straight. He's like, oh, wow. I have a child. I have to be doing right. 
And you know what God after begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 306, 360 and 5 years. And Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. And we know Methuselah lived to be the oldest man. So, I mean, he probably taught his son, he led his son, he did everything right. So, address the same struggles that you experience so that you don't claim generational curses, right? You address the same trouble you experience, address that with your children ahead of time. You know, start addressing it. Make sure they don't fall into the same traps because that is what you fell into. You know the traps. You know the signs of falling into that sin. Talk about the consequences. Talk about the signs. For example, let's look at drinking. Don't have drinking friends. You tell them, hey, don't, if you have friends that drink, don't hang out with them. If you have people, colleagues, you know, acquaintances, they should not be your friends, right? Don't have drinking friends. Go, go for happy hour. Don't think you're strong. You say, but daddy, I've not even drank. I know, I'm just warning you now. <laughs> because if that is a problem that you had, you know, don't hang out with them. Uh, don't say I'm a casual drinker. Don't fall into that trap. You know, I, I just, I'm just a casual drinker. I mean, I'll just drink if it's there, you know. No, avoid that completely. Because you have that problem. Your child is susceptible to having that problem, right? Uh, don't say I'm a casual drinker. See, you're, you know, they bring out science for you. I remember going through this when I was thinking about drinking, I mean, about alcohol, studying it and all of that. And I remember going through it. And there's uh, science out there in Google that, oh, your body needs alcohol. <laughs> Uh, no, look it up. <laughs> I'm sure it's still there. That your body needs alcohol, you know, just a little bit of alcohol to help your the whole system. Hey, guess what? They forget to tell you that your body makes alcohol. Your body makes the alcohol it needs. <laughs> you don't have to add to it, right? We can go without drinking. If your body needs alcohol, your, your body makes it. So the alcohol it needs, your body makes it. Anymore, it's poison. Right, you're poisoning your body. Um, then, so don't get deceived by so-called uh, science falsely called uh, so-called. Then drinking, then warn the child, warn them how drinking can destroy your life. You lose control of your thinking faculties. And I remember going to uh, bike lessons because I, I I can ride a motorcycle and to get a motorcycle license, you have to go through all the classes. If you guys have done that in PA, you know what I'm talking about. So you have to go through all the classes. So I went, remember going through the lecture, and they were just talking about drinking. This one lecture for 45 minutes was all about drinking. <laughs> it was just weird because I guess many people crash or drink and go on their bike and go out. Anyway, and it's very dangerous on the bike because you're just going to fall out. So what the teacher said was, you take the first glass, you're in your full faculties. You tell yourself, I'm just going to take one glass, and that is fine. I'm not going to take again. You've determined that with yourself. But the thing about alcohol, this is the word, teacher. The thing about alcohol is when you take the first glass, you don't think anymore. You've lost your thinking faculties, your determination, all the, the presets, all your principles, they just go. Then you take the second glass. It makes it even worse. It grows exponentially. You take the third glass. Once you take the first glass, it breaks down everything. Although you've thought to yourself, oh, I'm just going to take the first glass or just one glass, you end up taking more than you, you plan to. This is the war, teaching. So you lose your thinking faculties. It's detrimental to your health. I mean, you can take alcohol. As I said, it's poison. It's literal poison. I just want you to understand that. So you're taking poison that tastes good. Uh, to me, it doesn't taste good. But to some people, that tastes good and nice, makes them feel good. But it's destroying their brain. I mean, the brain's uh, snapping points, receptors and stuff, is shutting them down. And they can, it can lead to chronic health problems and even on the spot death. People have died of alcohol poisoning. Then what the Bible says, you see strange women. I mean, have you seen drunk people you know, just go, do wrong things? Uh, you lose control of your tongue. You start saying things. Out of the, see, the heart of man is desperately wicked, as the Bible says. You know, why most of us are with ourselves sitting down and talking and fellowshipping is because we have control of our tongue. <laughs> if, you, if you're like a child and you just say everything that comes to your mind, wow. <laughs> most of us are sitting next to each other. <laughs> so you lose control of your tongue. And they, they always excuse drunk people. Oh, he's just drunk. No, that's what is in his heart. If he has never heard it before, he has never thought about it before, he wouldn't say it. Have you noticed the drunk people, they don't just start speaking with tongues or something? <laughs> right? They always say what is already in their heart, what they've thought about and all of that. So you lose control of your tongue. Then motor accidents can happen, which is death or killing somebody else. Some people that are drunk, usually they don't even die. It's like they kill, they wipe out the whole family. But they survive. It's like, what? <laughs> 
usually. But most times, they, or they end up in jail, obviously, and or die. That happens. You destroy your finances because you're buying alcohol. You destroy your marriage. I mean, I can go on and on because alcohol leads to other sins that is being drunk. This is just an example that if you have this problem, this is what you should tell your children. This is what you should warn them. Use the word of God. Now, yes, you're telling them all these things. You're warning them how to destroy your life. Use the word of God. And that is why it's good to start now to teach your children to fear the Lord. I tell my children, hey, this is what I believe the word of God is saying. And this is why we do what we are doing. But you might get older, you might grow up and find out you have to do it a different way or that I was wrong here. See, even if you find out in future that I was wrong, for now you have to obey me because I'm following the word of God. Look at the word of God. Does it say anything different? No, then do it. If you can't prove to me that I'm wrong from the word of God, then do exactly what I tell you to do. So, it gives them the job, I'm sure when they're teenagers, I'm going to I'm gonna hear it. But it gives them the job of going to read their Bible and trying to prove me wrong. Because that's how I, too, I got into the Bible. I went to read the Bible to prove it wrong. <laughs> so, I want them to prove me wrong. So, I challenge them with the word of God. And I tell them, hey, at a certain point, you will be advising me. You will be older. You will know. Make sure you follow the word of God because this is what we follow. So once you bring out the word of God and show it to them from the word of God, this is what they follow. I mean, if people can follow the Quran, crying out loud, why can't we follow the word of God? The Quran is useless. It's not even good. It's not even readable. Like, and some people live their life by the Quran because it starts young. Everybody knows, oh, Muhammad, peace be on him or something. You know, and they just call God's name anyhow. <laughs> anyway, use the word of God to correct them. Make sure that you two are trying to follow the word of God. Because if you're telling them, hey, do the word of God, fear God, but you are not fearing God, you're just setting them up for the so-called generational curse that is going to come upon them. All the things that you're trying to warn them from, they will do it. You see, that's the thing. You, when you tell a child, don't do something, they want to do it. <laughs> so if you are a hypocrite, they will now end up doing it. I'll be saying, oh, you're lying. Because you say the word of God commands you to do this, but you're not doing it. And now you're telling me I should not drink because the word of God commands me, I'm going to drink because you're lying. Do you see how? So it will backfire if you are not following the word of God. Enoch got right for his son, as it reads to me. So... Tell them to flee, that they will laugh last. Yes, it's going to be suffering, but at the end, they should look at their and that's an, they should look at their friends, look at people that drink, and that's a good point. Show them examples, examples of people that drink the, their beginning and their end. <laughs> Show them those examples and always remind them of those examples. That helped me growing up. I remember I was coming to America to go to college, and my mom used to warn me. Before you have any girlfriend, and you know what I mean, before you have any girlfriend, finish your studies first, then you can have a girlfriend and all of that. Now, don't get into that. Don't go into smoking. Don't do all those things. Don't talk like them because at the end, and she'll bring examples. See this guy that he went to America, he destroyed his life. See this guy, he went to America, he destroyed his life. They had to bring him back, all of that. So I just look at those examples. Like, I don't want to end up like that. But I still did not believe her completely until what she said started happening. <laughs> right? When she says that happened, I was like, oh, wow. If she knows that this will happen, that means the end is going to be true. Do you see that? This is just with examples that she laid. So that's why I just focused on studies first. So tell them, do not test it. Flee from it. And have literal examples of people as proof. And make them develop a hatred for it. And this same goes for other sins. I just focused on one. Same goes for smoking, even divorce. Your divorce doesn't mean you warn your children about divorce. I'm not, I don't know if anybody's divorced. But I'm just saying, you don't think, oh, yeah, I'm divorced. Everything is fine. And you don't warn your children about it. Or abortions. You have to tell them you had an abortion. But... Warn them about abortions, uh, pornography, tattoos. You know, I had a, I was on a, uh, I had a talk show, and they were asking this lady, hey, you don't have tattoos. You know, this generation now, the cool thing is to have tattoos. Everybody has tattoos. Or who are the role models? The athletes, usually athletes I know. Anyway, the athletes, they all have tattoos. It's like, an, it's like every summer they add one. And so they're asking this lady, um, oh, you don't have tattoos, and why is that so? Then here's her response, and I want your children to have this. Remind your children of this response in case of peer pressure. Her response was, do you see a bumper sticker on a Lamborghini? 
So when people are pressuring them, she'll say, oh, why are you not having tattoos? Oh, tattoos are so cool. They say, see, this is a Lamborghini. Do you see a bumper sticker on a Lamborghini? Or a Bentley, <laughs> or a Maserati, you know? You don't mess up those cars, because they are well done. You don't put bumper stickers on them, right? So that is how you should, they should answer the question, so that the peer pressure is off of them. Help them out. Help your children to overcome these things. Think about the solutions and help them. And make sure it's grounded in the word of God, obviously. So when I was a child, I remember my dad, when he was getting rid of our in-house bar. Because we used to be Catholics, so we had a bar in the house. I remember it's a good picture, the bar, everything, with the drinks and the glass, all of that. Why I remember it very well is because there, was this, there were these small cups, very tiny glass cups. And I used to wonder, why are they drinking in such small cups? <laughs> As a child, I just remember that. You guys know why, right? Dry gin, you can't take a lot of it. So you just take a shot. I, you know, I, I had to research that when I got old. I never had the guts to ask, ask him. But, so I remember that very clearly. All those small cups were always there, and they just pour a drink. It was not in the refrigerator. I was wondering, like, what is going on? So fortunately, I didn't get into it because it was out of my reach. And I, but I remember him removing everything, destroying all of it, trashing it, pouring it out. So that picture is in my head, and that's why I just... It was just nothing to me. Like, I don't want alcohol because my dad poured it out, so I don't like it. I don't, I'm not interested in it, and I grew up that way. So maybe, he, I don't remember him saying, don't drink or anything, but just doing that gave me a picture. And why? Because my father hated it, so I hated it. And that's why it's good for children to have their parents as their role models. Make sure your, your child is following you, and how do you do that? It's not by forcing them, hey, do what I do. No, it's by... You know, being there for your child, doing good, and making sure they fear the Lord, and training them, then automatically they'll be your, uh, you'll be their role models, not somebody else. Bible says, ye uh, shall fear every man, his mother and his father. But I remember though, we still drank palm wine. I don't know if you guys know what palm wine is, but it's, uh, it's a natural fermented uh, drink. So it comes from the palm trees and they tap it from the palm trees. So this is not fermented, uh, commercially fermented wine. So my dad, although he wasn't drinking alcohol and stuff, we still drank palm wine and they, they would give it to us, but say, hey, you can't take more. You can't take too much. You're still a child. So we tasted though. So I remember palm wine. Naturally fermented is nothing close to the uh, commercially fermented, where they increase the alcohol content and all of that. So we weren't saved by then. So I was still drinking palm wine and stuff. It was still fun until my eyes were open to the teachings of the Bible. And that's why the Bible says in Psalm 119, Psalm 119 verse 99, 119, 99 says, I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients because I keep thy precepts. You see that? So you lead your child to the word of God, and your child will end up having more understanding than you. Not necessarily that oh, your child is smarter than you or anything, but the times, his own times and his own seasons, the things that come up in his own times, he will understand it more. At a certain point, our, because, of, uh, because of life, what is coming up in their generation, they have to use the Bible, not only what you say or the examples you give. So always lead your child to the Bible and the Holy Spirit will help them understand it to, for the application of their own times. Amen? Amen. Uh, another point, open to John chapter 9. John chapter 9. Sometimes reproaches in one's life is for the glory of God. It's not that, oh, the parent was cursed and generational curses are passing down. It's just for the glory of God. In John chapter 9 verse 1, the Bible says, And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither had this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. So it's just for the glory of God, so that God's works will be made manifest. And when God works, people glorify the Lord, they magnify the Lord. Open to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. 2 Corinthians 12, 7. So also, it's not necessarily that healing should come forth. It's not that, oh, something is going wrong in my life, so God just wants to correct it. You know, Sometimes God will just leave it there for his glory. Yes, this man that was born blind, he was healed, right? But he could have been blind and remained blind, right? For the glory of God. People are like, oh, wow, look at this blind man doing all these great things for the Lord. And you have two eyes. 
you know, <laughs> me I would have had one eye <laughs> by, by today, but thank God. But, but you have two eyes, and you're not doing anything for the Lord. Uh, uh, look at the story of, uh, uh, what's his name, Paul. What did Paul say? In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, And lest, lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. That's to curb his pride. Verse 8, For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecution, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So it's not everything that is a generational of course. Oh, it's because of my parents. Oh, I'm suffering because of this. I'm suffering because of that. It's also for the glory of God. You're suffering this for God's glory. Whether it's to help somebody else or be an example to other people or that God would take you out of that situation and show other people that, oh wow, if God can do it for this guy, the chief of all sinners or something, or if God can do it for this guy, then obviously God can do it for the rest of us. So that can be uh, all for the glory of God. So it's not a generational curse. All right, all that is by way of introduction. I have three points. <laughs> Actually, it is introduction, but it's three points to go fast. I have three points. Open to Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9, verse 20. It's not really three points. I want to look at three examples um, where people point and say generational curse. The Bible proves generational curse. And I want to prove to you that it's not what it appears to be, right? What people call generational curses is not what I just look at three of them. There might be more, but these are the three that came to me as I was preparing, and I know I don't have so much time. All right, point number one, the curse of the Canaanites. The curse of the Canaanites. Genesis chapter 9, verse 20, the Bible reads, And Noah began to be an husband man, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon uh, laid it upon both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father and their faces were backward and they saw not their father's nakedness and Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him and he said cursed be Canaan a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren and he said blessed be the Lord God of Shem and Canaan shall be his servant God shall enlarge Japheth and he shall dwell in the tent of Shem and Canaan shall be his servant. First of all, I'm not going to go into exactly what uh, Ham did. That's be a sermon for another day. But you can have your opinions. What well, we know is that what Ham did was wrong. And because of that, his son, or his generation, I should say, Canaan, was cursed that they will serve the older ones or the other brethren. So you, it looks like, oh yeah, uh, what's his name? Noah is just cursing his uh, uh, Canaan. And you notice, why is he not cursing Ham? Why is he cursing Canaan? It appears to be a prophecy, just as Jacob did with his children at the end, when it was like Jacob was blessing them, but it sounds like somewhere curses. Because it was the word of God upon their lives. It was just, it appears, it was a prophecy he was doing. It was that God will not show mercy on the family of Ham. And that's what it points out to, the mercy of God. You know, this sermon too can be about the mercies of God. Because people mistake, oh, God is not showing mercy on this family, therefore they're under a curse. If God decides not to show mercy on any of us, all of us will be under the curse. All of us will look like we're all cursed. <laughs> we're all cursed from generation to generation. But God is one showing mercy. And that's why it appears, oh, we're being blessed. It's because of the mercies of God. So God will not show mercy on Ham. Uh, and that is because of what Ham would do. That's, that's the generation of Canaan, as she say, or generation of Ham would do. For example, if God did not call Abram, what would Abram be? Abram would be serving the gods of his father. His father was an idol worshiper. So he probably would have been serving God. But when God spoke to Abraham, Abraham believed the Lord and it was counted up, uh, unto him for righteousness, right? It's because he believed God. 
because God knew that Abraham would believe, or Abraham at the time, would believe him when he spoke to him. And that's why God went and spoke to him. Open to Jeremiah. In Jeremiah, the same thing. You have to open that because of time. Jeremiah 1 verse 4, when God spoke to Jeremiah, he knew that Jeremiah would choose to obey him. So that's why he spoke to Jeremiah. And he said to Jeremiah in verse 4, uh, the Bible says, Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. This is talking about the foreknowledge of God. God knows the choice. It's not that he made him so that he would obey him. God had already made Adam. Adam fell. It's the same seed that kept keep going on. In iniquity were all formed. But God knew the choices, the foreknowledge of God that, okay, um, this guy is going to come from his parents, but this guy is going to listen to me. This guy is going to obey me. This guy is going to choose me and have faith in me. So I've already planned this guy's life because I know he'll make this choice. So people think that God is all sovereign. I mean, sovereign in the sense that he controls everything and he's a puppet master. That's not what it is. It is the foreknowledge of God. And that's why God is choosing these people. And that's why God is not choosing some people and that's why it appears that oh they have a generational curse upon them. No it's because that generation is not going to do anything for the Lord. So it's not going to waste his time. <laughs> right? Where it might look as if God is wasting his time. No it's a lesson for us. He's pointing us to something. Why did God waste his time with Israel? At the end he cast them out. No it was a lesson for us. Right? <laughs> because any other family would have been like that. If not God would be jumping from Abraham after Abraham Isaac, Jacob. He's like okay Maybe I pick up another family. Uh, he decided I'm just going to go with one and show everybody that this is just mankind. Right. Nothing is new under the sun. It would have been another family. <laughs> it would have been the same thing. There's probably another Abraham that you would have picked and it's the same thing. So it's just by, it's by faith and uh, God's showing his mercy. In Romans chapter 8 verse 29, the Bible says, For whom, Romans 8 29, I'll just read it. For whom he did foreknow, you see that? That starts off everything. For whom he did foreknow, he knew, knows the end from the beginning, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son so that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, that is person that he foreknew, whom he did predestinate them, he also called, and whom he called them, he also justified, and whom he justified them, he also glorified. So he knew that these people believe, he knew that Jeremiah will listen, he knew that Abraham would believe, so he had already predestinated them, called them, justified them glorify them from the beginning just like Jesus was slain from the foundation of the world so the children of Ham will be left to themselves in sin and at the end the cup of the Amorites will be filled up which is still part of the children of Ham uh, it's not just the Canaanites the Amorites the Hittites all the tites right so they'll all be <laughs> they'll all be uh, they, they, their cup will fill up of sin and then the punishment to come then God then that thing that was prophesied by Noah will come to pass. That, ha uh, that Japheth and Shem will take over their lands. So it does not mean that they are all going to hell. Jesus had a disciple called Simon the Canaanite. Right? So <laughs> it's not like, oh, this is a generational cause. Every single one of them are going to hell. No, the individual can come out of that. Right? It's just that land, those people, they are not for the Lord. And God is not going to show his mercy upon them. Right? To draw them out and keep them from that sin. All right, open to Genesis 25. Genesis 25, 21. The second one is Jacob and Esau. It's another common one. These are all popular stories that people might mistake and point to generational curse. Oh, Esau had a generational curse upon his people because, you know, God loved Jacob and he hated Esau, you know, all of that. But let's see the story from the beginning. Genesis 25, verse 21, the Bible says, And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord was entreated of him and... Rebekah, his wife, conceived, and the children struggled together within her, and she said, If it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. So, open to Romans 9.9. 9. Romans 9.9. 9. What did God say? One will be stronger than the other. The elder will serve the younger. There's nothing there about him saying, oh, I love some one more than the other. What does it sound like? What is it? It's a prophecy. It's the same prophecy. God foreknew what will happen. <laughs> right? You know, nothing would have happened if Rebecca did not go and ask of the Lord. It's not like God was like, hey, I want to tell you that I hate this person. No, he didn't even say that. Rebecca asked, what's going on? Okay, let me just give you a prophecy. 
that will happen, <laughs> right? The older one will serve the younger one, and one will be stronger than the other. And there are two nations in your womb, two peoples, that means a nation is a family. Right? So, uh, it's a prophecy that will happen in future because of the foreknowledge of God. Nowhere did God say he loved Jacob more than Esau before the birth of both of them. I'm talking about the individuals. Look at Romans 9.9. 9, For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, the children are not born, they haven't done good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that call it. Pause. Let's pause there. What is he saying? Remember, this is in parenthesis, right? So this is just additional information because you can just skip verse 11 and the story continues. But from 10 to 12. So for the children being not yet born, that means they're still in the womb, and they haven't done good or evil. So it's not like, oh, once you're conceived, you've done evil. Therefore, you have to be baptized as soon as you're born. That's a, that's a sermon for another day. But having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that call it. So who are the people that God calls? Let's go back to Romans 8, 29. I'll just read it for you. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Those are the people that he called. The foreknowledge of God. Knowing that Jacob would choose the Lord's way, the ways of God, and Esau will not choose the way of the Lord, so he decided that the election will be with Jacob. I'm going to show mercy on Jacob. Hey, the older will serve the younger. He, he's talking about the future, not necessarily about those particular people, because they have not done good or evil. You see that? The, the people of Jacob, right? That's whom he chose. For the election's sake, that means for where the seed will come from. Not, oh, one will be saved and the other one will be saved. I believe Esau went to heaven because his father loved him and Isaac was a good man. So it was said to her, the elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Say, as it is written. No, it's not talking about Genesis. It's talking about Malachi chapter 1, verse 2. Malachi 1, 2. I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Pause. He's like, right there. God is talking about Jacob and Esau. He's not talking about the persons. He's talking about the two nations, the two peoples are in thy womb. So it's talking about the nations, the seed, the descendants. And you might not understand this if you've not understood the whole story of the Bible and what section you are in. Malachi is the end of the Old Testament, folks. Something has happened. Obadiah has happened. Do you know what happened to Obadiah? The destruction of Edom, that they are not coming back. That was a prophecy of Edom. Edom, because you put your hands in the destruction of Judah, I'm going to destroy you and you're never coming back. Never. <laughs> so, at this point, in Malachi, Malachi is writing and telling the, Israel, uh, the, the, Jew, uh, the Jews, you say I've not loved you. Look at your brother, Edom. Look at the people of Edom. Where are they? They're gone. And you're saying I don't love you? I have mercy on you. <laughs> That's what he's trying to say. He's not talking about Jacob and Israel. He's talking about the peoples. Right. You see that? So, it's not a generational curse. It's not, oh, yeah, it's just a generational curse because of what Esau did. No, it's because of what the people did. What did they do in Obadiah? Read it. It doesn't take too long. And therefore, it's pointing to what? The mercies of God. Let's go back to Romans 9. Because it goes on to say in Romans 9, 14. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that will it, nor of him that run it, but of God that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might shew my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore he had mercy on whom he will have mercy, and on whom he will, he had in it. Oh sorry, and on whom he will, yeah, he had in it. So yeah, God will have mercy on whom we have mercy. So the fact that we're enjoying the mercies of God, the fact that we have the message of God and God is working with us and working with our children, hey, make sure it continues to the next generation, next generation, you want to teach them the right way, teach them to fear the Lord, so that you will have the opposite of what people are calling generational curse. So not 
this is not a generational cause. More so, it's pointing to the blessing of God upon Jacob, and in contrast, appears to be a curse upon the Edomites. But they warranted their curses, as I said, just as the Pharisees warranted the curses upon them. Because the Pharisees said, oh, it is our fathers that killed the prophet. Jesus is like, oh, of course, it's your fathers, because you're going to do what your fathers are doing. So you are going to kill me, that is the son of God. So therefore, all the, the punishment that came on your fathers, you will suffer all of that. <laughs> All right, point number, the last one, the Jews guilty of the blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, there's a generational curse there. All the Jews are suffering. You know, just because of what happened there, all the Jews are suffering is a generational curse. That is not what it seems. Open to Matthew 27. Matthew 27, verse 22. So let's see what happened there. Remember the first one is the curse of Canaan. Second one was Jacob versus Esau. This was all about the choices the generation will make. And it's not different from the last one. In, Genesis, uh, in Matthew 27, verse 22, this is a curse placed upon them by their parents. The Bible says, Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What evil had he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. I mean, every time I read this, it gives me a chill. Just, how do you say that? <laughs> Knowing what they know, they know the laws of God about innocent blood. I mean, just keep quiet. If you have nothing good to say, just keep quiet, right? So, now, their generation, that generation, and probably the subsequent generation, all wiped away. God just destroyed all of them. The Romans came and wiped them out, 70 AD, uh, 135, that is, uh, 135 AD, came again and wiped them out. I mean, pretty much, if not all of them are dead, <laughs> right? Uh, and all sent out. So that's, I'm talking about the ones that still held on to the temple and all of that, like worshiping the temple and all of that. But the Christians, they all spread out there in other nations. So their physical blood is not all wiped out. It's the people that rejected the Lord. Open to Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 3, verse 12. This is not a generational curse. This is a religious curse. It's a curse on their religion. Of all the religions, this one has this specific curse that the blood of Jesus Christ is upon them. <laughs> right? That is, of all the religions, that's why the wrath of God is upon them to the uttermost, as the Bible says. Just like what happened with the Pharisees. Now, anyone, so who is under this curse? It's not a generation because they can skip generations. But if anyone from any generation, any race, any ethnicity, if you believe that Jesus is not a Christ and that, hey, you agree with them, let him be crucified, hey, that blood is upon you. If you believe that. So that's, it's not about, oh, it's passing out from father to child. No, it's not a generational curse. It's a religious curse. It has nothing to do with ethnicity or, you know, I don't want to say all the catchwords. But it is purely religion, transcends culture and race. In Acts chapter 3, verse 12, because the same people, I mean, how many, what, a few months after that? <laughs> One month, two months after that? Peter was preaching to them in verse 12. He says, and when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why you look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, had glorified his son Jesus, whom he delivered up, and denied him in the presence of Pilate, while he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you, and killed the prince of life, whom God had raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses, and his name through faith in his name had made this man strong whom ye see and know yea the faith which is by him had given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all and now brethren I want that you that through ignorance ye did it as did also your rulers but those things which God before had showed you by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer he had so fulfilled but it's too late for you guys. You have a generational curse upon your heads. No, no, I'm just kidding. All right, verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. So how can they get out of this? Oh, it's a generational It must always have. No, no, no. If they repent, they're out of that. So it's a religious curse. Just change the way you think. I don't think that Jesus should be crucified anymore. I think we're wrong. He's the one that God sent. Oh, then you're out of it. The blood is no more upon you. 
as easy as that. And in fact, these are the same people that said it. <laughs> so it's not even like the next generation. The same people that said it. So again, not a generational curse. All right. So this sermon is for the church. A congregation of believers, people that believe by grace through faith. And so it's not for false religions. Pentecostals especially, they deal with generational curses a lot. I was a Pentecostal, so I know what I'm talking about. So they deal with generational curses a lot, and they, they have deliverance services, they have prayer meetings, and they're like casting out devils. Oh, anyone with generational causes of sickness, of generational cause of this, generational cause of that. This is like, it was happening so much, even as a teenager, I was like, something, I mean, every year is a generational curse. And at the end of that generational curse um, conference, right, <laughs> they say all the generational curses have been canceled. Then the next year is another generational curse. It's like, so which ones came up? Which ones did you miss? Every pastor is just like generational curse, generational curse. And usually for the young ones, I, I don't know if it was just the young ones, because, oh, they are coming up in life. So I was coming up in life, and it's oh, generational curse, one generational curse. I'm always praying. All the curses that my parents had should not come on me, all of that. So <laughs> that is unbelievers. That's what they are going through. And they are misunderstanding the word of God. They are misusing and abusing the word of God. The thing is that the devil are toying with those ones with the false, false, uh, false religions because they're worshiping devils. They are toying with them, and when a generation is going, is dying, the devils want the next generation. So it appears to be a curse upon them, right? If it's a sickness or something they are into, because the devils want them to continue like their parents, so we get them into the same sin, the same sickness, the same everything. So you keep sacrificing to the devils, and you say sacrifice, yes. They do blood rituals, they do different things. They go and see visions and see different things, uh, witch doctors and stuff. So they keep sacrificing to the same devil. So the devils will give them the same sickness. Devil, so it looks like a generational curse, but these just people are just under a curse, period. Right? And that's the point I want to make. Also, before that, another thing they mistake is um, genetic dis uh, disorders or something that are passed down. So it's in the DNA, it's passed down. You think it's a generational curse, but it's just natural, which is outside the scope of this sermon. In Proverbs 26, verse 2, the Bible says, As the bird that wandering, sorry, as the bird by wandering, as the swallow by flying, so the curse that is causeless shall not come. So cause it, curses will not happen unless they are proved by God. God is a just God. He's, he's just. And if the curse is not causeless, that there's no cause for the curse then it's not going to happen. Because God is the one that has the power over us. The devils, that's why the devil is called the accuser of the brethren. If it was that, God just gave him power over us. If he sins, punish, punish him. The devil will not need to accuse us before God. The devil will just go, once you sin, he just slaps you or something. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Right? Once you sin, you just fall sick. Or once you sin, you just, because the devil is the one that he has power. But no, when we sin, he goes to the Lord. And he's like, hey, see your son. He's sinning. <laughs> right? So then a curse can come upon you. A curse is when evil happens to you, right? So then evil can come upon you. God might chastise you, all of that. But the devil is just trying to get evil to be upon you. So a curse, a curse that is causeless shall not come. Open to Galatians chapter 3, verse 10. Galatians 3, verse 10. So the real curse that people are under is the punishment of hell. And that is the curse that the Lord is the one that puts, right? So people are worried about generational curses. You as believers, you don't have to worry about generational curses. Just be right with the Lord, right? And his mercy will be upon you. His mercy will be upon your children. And that is the difference. The mercy of God upon your life versus no mercy of God upon your life and you're left to your wickedness, you're left to the flesh and lots of the flesh and God is not drawing you in. So don't quench the spirit or, or, or grieve the Holy Spirit. In, uh, I told you open Galatians 3 before you open there. I'll read you Numbers 23 8. The Bible says, How shall I curse whom God had not cursed? Or how shall I defy whom the Lord had not defiled? Right? So if God did not curse somebody else, I don't care what kind of curse you want to put on the person, that curse is not going to happen. It's as simple as that. Balaam knew that. Whether you want to say Balaam was saved or not saved, Balaam knew the ways of God. Right? And he knew this, how much more us, that we have the whole Bible, we, we know who God is. So if God does not curse you, don't worry about generational curse. The main curse is the curse of the law. As the Bible says in Galatians 3.10, for as many as are of the works of the, sorry, for as many are, 
of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Many people are under the works of the law. Say, oh no, we are not following the Bible. But you are trying to do good. Right? Which is imprinted in you, written in your conscience from the beginning. So many people are trying to do good, so they are under the curse of the law. They think doing good will lead them somewhere good, uh, lead them to heaven, or be pleasing to the Lord. No, they are not justified in the eyes of God. So therefore, all the curses of the law, and if you want to find a chapter that has a good bunch of the curses, go to Deuteronomy 28. Don't read the first 13. Yeah. <laughs> you start from like 15 or so. I don't remember exactly what verse. But a whole bunch of it is just, gosh, are you be when you're going? Gosh, are you? I mean, it's just curses upon curses upon curses. That is the curse of the law. And uh, because they're trying to do good. So these are the people, uh, this, that is the curse that they should worry about. And this is what we should help them overcome. And we ourselves should not be worried about generational curses. But they, they are under a curse because they don't have the mercy of God upon them. So we want to bring the mercies of God upon them. We want to bring the grace of God upon them. We want to save them. Only God can redeem them from this curse which can be manifesting in what they so-called as generational causes, and which is the whole illustration of the law. Um, so as, uh, this is the cause that we should save unbelievers from. The point number one, what Israel would do for the Canaanites. What should Israel do for the Canaanites? Get them saved. Get them to be an Israelite. Come and serve the Lord. Because Canaanites will be like, oh, we are cursed because of Ham. No? You, 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 oh, let's fix that generational cause. No, all you have to do is get them saved. And anyone that listen is out of the course. So that is the job you have to do. Don't do more than God has asked you to do. Just do. See, what, what, do you, what does God require of us to do his will? The whole duty of man. Just obey him. What does Israel have to do for the Edomite? You know, oh, Edom, we're all on that course. We're going to serve you. How about you just become an Israelite? <laughs> just join. Join the tribe. You're free from the curse. <laughs> right? Oh, on that generational curse. Get them saved. Right? It's not about, oh, yeah, let's take it to this and heal that sickness or heal this. Just get them saved. So what should a Christian do to the Jew? The Jew is under the cross. So, oh, just get them saved. Right. <laughs> the same answer, the same solution. Salvation. See, people are under curses. And you're wondering, okay, why God is showing us mercy. And you know, God wants to show them mercy too. Right. How about you do it? And those are say, God, why are you not showing them mercy? Why are you not saving them? Why are they under this curse? You have the duty. We have the duty. We have that ministry. Amen? Amen? Still in Galatians, look at chapter 3, verse 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. When you're in Christ. So all, Christ has taken the course and all of that. In Romans 8, 1 and 2, the Bible says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death. So a curse is a pronouncement of evil upon another person. So us as believers, what is our heritage? Right? What are we inheriting? What is, it, what is the, the promise for believers? Our heritage here and now. Open to Isaiah 54. And that's the last one. Isaiah 54 verse 17. First of all, we should pray against evil. Right? But, uh, Jesus taught us to pray, deliver us from evil. Uh, New King James is say from the evil one. That's a very different thing. Right? Deliver us from evil. And we, we should not walk after the flesh, but after the spirit. So that we're not enmity or in enmity with the Lord. Because then, God will bring harm to you. Because you're an enemy of the Lord. So, this is how we avoid evil. Unless, for the glory of God, that evil will come upon us. Whether it's persecution or affliction. Amen? So what is our heritage? Isaiah 54 verse 17, as I end. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Let's bow our heads. Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you for teaching us about generational curses. I pray, O oh Lord, that you open our eyes to the wisdom of your word. Help